last time, this will be heavily uh, philosophical, uh, probably in the worst sense. Uh, in other words, uh, the philosophy that is not allowed uh, in the uh, rooms of academia in the Ateneo. So uh, um, you, might, you might want back to the old days when there was too much mathematics in it. There won't be any this time. Um, to dispel any misunderstanding, the idea is not to convince you that intuitionism is the way to go and everything else is uh, really bad. No. The study is going to go from outside philosophy. But unlike most such studies, where you go either in a Marxist way, and you say, well, this guy is trash because he represents this kind of social class, and you don't need to read him because it's no good, or psychoanalytic, or dead white males, or whatever. All these ideologies come from outside and try to demolish something. That's not my aim. I come from the outside, and I try to rehabilitate something. So um, what is the outside? I mean, what, what's the problem and what do I try to do? Well, the problem is that there is a singular thing in the history of mathematics and philosophy that the major mathematician and philosopher is considered fair game to be belittled, ridiculed, and whatever else you want, it's open season on him. If you want to say anything bad on Brouwer, you're okay. In fact, you, you, you're going to be applauded. And the question is why? I mean, is that, you know, is this in the nature of things or is it a major misunderstanding? Well, my idea is that it is a major misunderstanding that it's so major that it goes to the very core of what mathematics is. So let's see what the problem is then. Oh, um, whoops, uh, here perhaps. OK, now it's going. So in the first part, I will give you quotations so you can see that there actually is a problem. In other words, I'm not solving a non-existing problem. So these are going to be quotes about this hostil hostility towards Brouwer's intuitionism. For example, and I here will go with a laundry list of quotations that will show you that, yeah, there is a problem. Here is Charles McCartney, an expert on intuitionistic logic. What does he say? Now we seem to be left with only one alternative, that constructions are themselves phenomenal objects akin to pains and after images. Their intrinsic properties are only those which they seem to have, and these are solipsistic, unshared, unshareable, and on some outlooks, incommunicable. As is well known, Brouwer encouraged just this sort of mathematical solipsis. He declared intuitionistic mathematics to be the record of the fruits of the creative activity of a single individual. Constructions are phenomenal objects which, in the mind of the mathematician, make up a kind of Lego set, pieces of which can be assembled and displayed on the inner visual field. Ultimately, the facts of mathematics are just those which can be put together from this fundamental element. It is clear that we ought not to follow Brouwer. So this is an intuitionistic log logician, a philosopher, who says these things. Now, there are several disparaging comments. Solipsistic, that's not a great thing to say about somebody. Yeah. Single individual, yeah. in the mind of Brouwer, and all this stuff, right? OK. Next. 
Giovanni Sambin, who maybe known to the audience. A constructivist mathematician writes in 2008 at the Serizy conference for 100 years uh, of intuitionism, we are here to celebrate a master, namely Brouwer. And 100 years from the birth of intuitionism, I believe that the best way to keep Brouwer alive is to try and go beyond Brouwer himself. To go beyond Brouwer means to learn his lesson, but also try to fix his mistakes and to soften in ourselves some hardness in his personality. And in this way to keep him alive, to confine Brouwer into the prison of what he has materially written would mean to kill him again. Again, we see that, yeah, this guy had a great, some great idea, but just get away from most of he ever said why the idea is any good. The philosopher Karl Posey, who de devotes in 2020 a book on mathematical intuitionism, would write ironically in 1998. First, suppose, as I have argued, that Brouwer's position is primarily mathematical. Why does he encumber it with this boogaboo about language in general and about Hilbert's concentration on formal language in particular? So here he is expressing not his own views, but what people in general, philosophers, feel the irritation is with Brouwer. What does Georg Kreisel say? Well, you might say Georg Kreisel had never anything good to say about anyone, so he, unless uh, the person was good, so what's the big deal? Well, but let's see what he says in particular. I think he liked Bridget Bondo. Ah, he liked that. Oh, many, many great uh, looking women. Yeah, he showed up usually at parties with uh, all kinds of actresses and things. Yeah, that's true. No, but I'm saying within the story that we're telling. <laughs> yeah, you're right. So, Gödel, in 1987, he writes, Gödel was utterly bored by Brouwer, unlike several logicians and mathematicians who, being dry themselves, were buoyed by Brouwer's probably genuine exuberance. Apparently, he, Brouwer, did not like to be interrupted anyway fittingly for a good solipsist. With little knowledge of the actual biographical facts that led to the pause on Brouwer's publications, which were not available at the time, Kreisel proposes in 69, in kind of an obituary, an entirely implausible explanation if one takes Brouwer's own philosophical right seriously, obviously, Kreisel doesn't do that. Be that as it may, it is a fact that Brouwer himself devoted the 10 years after publication of the papers by Heiting and Gödel to nine non-scientific activities, although objectively these papers concerned essential points of his life's work. And although he was only 50 and in good health, it does not seem unreasonable to suppose that he had received an intellectual shock Okay, Gödel's immensely natural proofs did not need anything like the heavy distinctions which Brouwer thought essential to his development of constructive mathematics, nor incidentally the ingenious constructions that Hilbert had introduced into proof theory. What they did involve was a clear perception of aims and principles, a philosophical non-doctrinaire analysis alien to the logical activists of the time. Seeing the incomparable superiority of this kind of analysis, Brouwer had to face the question, consciously or unconsciously, to what extent he had even begun to master his own logical ideas. So you see what a disaster this thing made. I mean, what bad luck that Brouwer had such great contemporaries, you know? So this is on the side of, um, of logicians and philosophers, what they're saying. Now, there is a subtler way to ignore him completely. That's the Michael Dummett way, you know, which is 
ignore whatever he said and provide a completely disconnected justification for intuitionism. What do historians have to say? They also have something to say because you can't let this guy you know have his life. No. Ivor Grattan Guinness, reviewing the first volume of this major biography of Brower in two volumes, uh, encompassing something, I don't know, 900 pages, writes in 1999 in the Bulletin of the American Mathematical Society, no less. Part of the mystique around Brouwer is caused by the notorious obscurity, one could say incoherence of his philosophy. So this is stuff that you can write and you, you get some applause, you know, you're cool. He says, Alan Heiting became a major protagonist of intuitionism without the supernatural. Wow, you know, you hit one again. Now, Jeremy Gray, reviewing the same biography in Metascience, some you know, journal that you don't really go to. There was a solipsistic streak in him that strengthened his inability to get people on his side, that elevated a reasonable but by no means secure philosophical opinion to one of inflexible rectitude that kept him illiberal and unable to see that his allies were increasingly right-wing in toxic times, and that made him capable of cruelly selfish behavior. Now, that's even stronger, you know. He just doesn't have just a stupid philosophy. He's an evil person. Now, how illiberal was he? Let's see. How illiberal was Brown? Well, in 1935 and in 1939, he was elected to the town council of Blaricum. And what do you think was Blaricum, a stronghold of right-wingers? No, it was a ref refuge for artists. That's what Blaricum was. And what was he advocating for on this town council? The preservation of the local heath. Well, obviously a specifically right-wing thing, right? Uh, better access for workers while keeping out cars. Yeah, that, that's what right-wingers do. A race for the local police. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Keep the order. Yeah. Added improvements to a plan for the construction of a cycle path. The improvement of the soccer field. When I said this in another lecture at Chapman University, Marco Panza said, it's enough. This is my guy. You don't need to tell us anything anymore. If it was for Calcio, that's it. When the Committee of Action for God demanded the bearing of the periodical of the free thinkers from the public library, Brower remarked that according to the state's instructions, all groups must be represented. So they can't remove the free thinkers material. That's illiberal people. We'd like to have them. Let's see how illiberal was he when he spoke at the 10th International Congress of Philosophy in Amsterdam. Power over fellow creatures will be avoided. Firstly, because one would get mixed up with the limitations of other people's liberty of action. Ah, he's a libertarian. Yeah, that's it. And secondly, because those fellow creatures are part of the reflex image held out to mind from his deepest home, therefore have to be respected and must not be judged, let alone condemned, despised, or rejected, even if they are enemies to be fought against. Okay. Now, you think that this kind of thing has stopped, you know? The, the first version of this paper from what you're hearing from, I send it to Eustace Dealer, who is an expert on uh, realizability kind of, I mean, of uh, um, dialectica type interpretations of uh, intuitionistic logic. So basically, he's a specialist in intuitionistic logic. And he said, oh, uh, it's great that these kinds of, you know, defamations about Nazi and so on are over. And just when he you know, answered that, it was pointed out to me that 
in the Times Literary Supplement, there was a paper in, I mean, there's a review of a book by Stephen Budiansky in which Brower is made a budding Nazi. And um, I wrote to the writer, Cheryl Misak, as the chair of the Department of the Philosophy of Science at Toronto University, that this is complete nonsense. And uh, she said she'll leave it to the specialist because she's not a specialist. She didn't change anything about that. So, um, defamations heard to the grapevine are passed on regardless of the absence of any mention of anything remotely resembling the accusations in the extensive correspondence related to the Mathematische Annalen affair. What was this affair? Well, Brouwer, after having gotten his uh, topological results, was invited by Felix Klein to be on the board of the Mathematische Annalen. In 1928, Hilbert thought that he was a threat to his own program, so dismissed him under the um, under the protest of Einstein and Cara Theodori, and then the whole um, committee was revamped and there were only three were left from all those. And um, so in 2021, Stephen Budiansky, in this book, Journey to the Edge of Reason, The Life of Kurt Gödel, what does Stephen Budiansky do? Well, he writes these kinds of biographies. I don't know what else. No? And uh, Brouwer becomes a committed area nationalist. In the review of this book, he becomes a budding Nazi collaborator, which is even greater, you know? What's the source of all this? Where are we sent in these books to hear about these great things? In Abraham Frankel's memoirs, in which we read the dispute took on a particular nuance in the sense that the Dutchman Brouwer set himself as a champion of Aryan Germans. Consequently, Hilbert removed him from the editorial board of the Mathematische Annal after he objected to what he felt were too many Eastern European Jews, or student authors. This is completely made up. It does, there is no such thing. The correspondence to this thing is extensive. It was published to a large extent by uh, Van Dalen, there is no such thing. It's completely fabulation that got to Frankel somehow through the grapevine, probably produced by someone around Hilbert who tried to denigrate Brouwer, and it has survived to 2021. He's Allies were increasingly right-wing, as uh, we're told by, uh, by Jeremy Gray. Well, he never cared about the affiliation of his friends. He had some national socialist friends like Biberbach or Fyodor Wann, but he had communist friends which were even closer, Gerrit Manuri and Henry Wiese. What are we going to say now? Now, is this any any surprise? No, we know from 1787 that also will fly, as it were, on the wings of the wind and carry its tails to every corner of the earth, while truth lags behind. Her steps, though sure, are slow and solemn, and she has neither vigor nor activity enough to pursue or overtake her enemy. So, so there is a problem for sure that we need to address. And uh, how are we gonna solve it? Well, we're gonna solve it, as I said, from outside philosophy. And what is the outside philosophy? Well, we're gonna use two sources. One that distinguishes between Eastern and Western mind, not popular today, obviously, for ideological reasons, but it was published in 1956 where the ideology was non-existent. And the second is Erich Fromm's to have or to be. Now, this may sound completely absurd because, okay, 
Haas, at least, Haas Books was never a bestseller. But how can you come into philosophy with a guy who sold millions of books, you know, Eric Fromm? I mean, this is like Bob Dylan, you know? Are you gonna you know, tell us that this is any good? I mean, philosophy needs to be incomprehensible and shouldn't sell at all. How could you come up with this thing? But let's see, let's wait until we get there. And we'll see how we get. Now, it's not true though that everybody said these kinds of things about him. There are in particular two philosophers who took him seriously, very seriously. I mean, he's taken seriously by other people. Some people try to say, no, he's not crazy because there is stuff connected with, say, Husserl. Okay. And Husserl, nobody writes these kinds of things about Husserl, right? So you shouldn't write these kinds of things about Brouwer either. I mean, even if you're an analytic philosopher, you kind of have a reverence towards these kinds of, you know, continental people. Yeah. So. So this is how some people try to say it. Others, there, there are two in particular who say things that are very, very close to what I'm saying are Jean Largeau and Michael Declepsen. So this literature that takes Brouwer seriously tries to establish usually links between his philosophy and other people's philosophy that shows that, you know, at least he wasn't an independently crazy person. So the first such attempt was undertaken by Oscar Becker in his book Mathematische Existenz, which was also a part of this Jahrbuch für Phenomenologische Forschung. And there, from the point of view of a thoroughly for Heidegger philosophy, Oscar Becker thinks that his the philosophical genealogical tree of Brouwer is Aristotle, Descartes, and Kant. Well, my problem with this is these three people are, you know, most the sacre of philosophy. You don't speak in these terms, even if you disagree with them about Aristotle, Descartes, or Kant. So there must be something else that is in Brouwer's philosophy that gives you the freedom to say anything. It can't be just these people. So I'm not against any of these things. They're all great, but they don't explain the problem. They're not even meant to do so. They want other things. In the PhD thesis of 2003, Hesseling finds parallels with the Leibniz philosophy of the 1920s, as well as with Bergson. Largeau also finds that there are common things with Bergson. Um, now, parallels with Husserl are more recent without the for Heidegger stuff. Is uh, Mark Van Aten has a whole book on this, Brouwer and Husserl. And uh, Thiessen had also an uh, in-depth study about this. Now, who else is kind of in his camp? Schopenhauer is found to be very close to Brouwer. In fact, Jean Largeau mentions him, Michael Detlefsen mentions him. And the most in-depth in mention is in this book by Marcel van Bell, which is called Schopenbrauer that in fact, Brouwer is the natural continuation of Schopenhauer's philosophy. It's in Dutch though. Largeau finds that another feature that relates Schopenhauer and Brouwer, the discredit that start, struck their work. Should we believe that each type of culture has its own incompatibilities? We're gonna focus on this last 
part. Because we're going to think that it has to do with the type of culture, not with uh, disagreements with Hilbert or, you know, um, accidental things. Now, again, Schopenhauer would not explain this type of reaction that Brouwer uh, incites. Because Bra uh, Schopenhauer had a strong influence on you know, Nietzsche, Tolstoy, Wittgenstein, Choran, uh, Freud, Jung, uh, writers, poets, uh, Einstein, Pauli. Um, so, okay, it may have been limited in time, but still he had his time. Nothing remotely similar can be said about Brouwer's philosophy. There weren't these, you know, um, disciples of Brouwer or people who thought that, you know, his philosophy is great at any time. So, as I said, um, these genealogies that tell us that he comes from here and there and that he see, he resembles to the Leibniz philosophy or to Bergson. Well, Bergson had his time again, uh, where he was super famous, where you know, people came that had no connection with philosophy to sit in on his lectures. Well, nothing similar happened to Brown. So what about Husserl, who's the uh, most uh, insistent uh, comparison recently? Well, Husserl, first of all, was a close friend of Hilbert. And their philosophies of mathematics, despite differences, share a mathematics first, non-revisionist approach toward mathematics, as Miria Hattimo points out. Now, Mark Van Aten disagrees with this. He thinks that if Husserl had followed his philosophy, he should not have had a mathematics first approach, and he should have done what Brouwer did if you were a mathematician at the same time. So I'm just mentioning it so you know that this is not Hartimus' uh, opinion is not shared by everyone. So again, there must be some other aspect that differentiates Brouwer from Husserl that is responsible for the irritation that Brouwer causes. Now, would the mediation by Husserl have helped? I mean, Husserl wrote in a letter in 28 to Heidegger after he visited Amsterdam that the most interesting in Amsterdam were the long conversations with Brouwer who made a very important impression on me one of a thoroughly original, radically sincere, genuine, very modern men. Would this have avoided the outcome of the so-called Grundlagenstreit? I mean, was it just a personality problem or a culture problem? I mean, if you're a professor in Germany, you're akin to a feudal lord and you don't accept that some people, you know, will disagree with you. That's not what happens. So it's a difference between Prussia and the Netherlands, which have completely different you know, cultures and understandings of uh, freedoms and the freedom to disagree in particular. So it, it may appear that it's just a, um, an accident. And Haiting even says that he believes that it was an accident. My point is that it's not an accident that these are the superficial reasons for the rejection of intuitionism and this kind of you know, irritation and derision at, the, at Brouwer's address. So it would, such a mediation perhaps would have raised the level of civility, but would not have stopped the, um, the disallowance of intuitionism because there are deeper reasons. And this talk will focus on the deeper reasons, not on the superficial ones of personalities and that kind of thing. Now, 
What things were put forward? Other things. Herbert Neftens, who wrote a whole book on uh, this matter, um, found that Brouwer's philosophy of mathematician, mathematics and his intuition is, were doomed because they were counter-modernist. Now I'm gonna explain what this counter-modernism is. I mean, you have a long version in this book and a short version, he wrote some paper where he summarizes what he thinks that these common traits are. So he says there are two common traits of the various modernisms that I identify as central. And these are the autonomy of cultural production and second, the departure from the vision of an immediate representation of the world of experience. The artist, the composer, or the scientist define what is good and true in their respective fields, and they define it autonomously, independently of political, religious, or philosophical authority, and largely not only independently from, but against the beliefs dictated by common sense. So here he describes modernism as this you know, big movement in um, literature, arts, uh, music, you know, everything. And then there is not the anti-modernist, but the counter-modernist mo movement that is part of modernism. So it arises with modernism. So that is why I chose the term counter-modernism instead of anti-modernism. It is the counterpart to modernism insisting on the question whether there is not some natural substance to the truth and meaning of mathematics. The counter-modernist attitude claims that there is such substance, mostly called intuition. Okay? So basically, you're modernist if you say anything goes, and you're counter-modernist if you says, well, there is a human nature and we are connected to some things and it's better to do those things than arbitrary things. Now, does counter-modernism on its own, suppose Brouwer is a counter-modernist, so we don't agree, disagree with this. Would that have condemned him at this status? And here I look at another example of a 100% counter-modernist, Gottlob Frege. Did he do poorly? Well, no, not quite. Frege was not only counter-modern. He failed to even understand what Hilbert was doing as his correspondence with uh, Hilbert on the Grundlander Geometry show. And then his polemic in the pages of the Jahresbericht der Deutschen Mathematikervereinigung. So he, at least Brouwer, understood very well what Hilbert was talking about. He disagreed with it, but he didn't misunderstand. Frege had no idea what Hilbert was doing. And did you think that this uh, uh, hampered his uh, posterity? No, not at all. In fact, he's doing fantastically today. There is a Frege industry in philosophy. So being counter-modern doesn't relegate you to the dustbin of history, quite the contrary. Um, why was he counter-modern? Well, he asked for axioms to be true in an absolute way. In other words, don't tell me you just want this to work for your theory. Um, he rejected non-Euclidean geometry. We're talking even in the beginning of the 20th century. Um, he had nationalist and anti-Semitic views. Well, none of this, uh, you know, matters. So things are, you, you can do great with all this stuff. So again, even if he was a, even if we allow him the label counter-modern, that doesn't, Explain why you can say all these things about him. Mertens also suggests that there is a correlation between anti-modernism and nationalism. Um, yeah, this I said already about him. 
as I said, the mathematicians are surprised about the, uh, the great standing of uh, Frege among philosophers. Um, as Hans Freudenthal wrote in 1960, I never understood why he's so highly esteemed today. I mean, about Frege, because a mathematician who reads him and thinks that this guy has no idea what he's talking about. So it's not clear why he's so greatly, um, yeah. Was he a new player? Uh, yes, he was, he used to be Brouwer's assistant in Amsterdam, and they didn't get along well. So when the opportunity came, he took a professorship at Utrecht. Yeah. So Husserl is not an explanation. Countermodernism isn't one. Bergson isn't one. Lebensphilosophie -philosoph isn't one. So it has to be somewhere else. And we claim it's not personality either. Here is another person. So we've seen Jean Largeau with his thing about you know, cultures. And here is the quotation from Mick Detlefsen's chapter, Constructive Existence Claims from 1998. He, Brower, was a kind of mathematical existentialist in that he sought a conception of mathematical knowledge that takes it basic to our human existence. For this to be so, he believed, mathematical knowledge must be intimately related to our most basic knowledge of ourselves. That is to that existential awareness that we have of ourselves as willing, acting beings. Such views are, to be sure, extraordinary when viewed in the light cast by the bland and vapid views that have dominated the philosophy of mathematics of the past few decades. They are not, however, for all that, either silly or out of place. So here we see a major philosopher in the Anglo-Saxon tradition saying that actually the standard philosophy of mathematics is bland and vapid, and Brouwer's is neither silly nor out of place. So this is extremely rare. I don't know of any other philosopher in the Anglo-Saxon world who said anything similar. Because Jean Largeau, okay, is in France, well, France doesn't matter for the, you know, the analytic philosophy uh, dominating version. Again, a quote from Jean Largeau's book from 1993, Intuition and Intuitionism, in which he writes, does this mean that our mathematics is based on a substance attribute ontology reflected in our language, subject copula attribute sentences inherited from the ancient Greeks while intuitionist mathematics presupposes an ontology of processes which is repelled by our thinking habits. Well, this is exactly what I will elaborate on independently of Largeau, because the first version of this paper that you know, will show up in the handbook of the history and philosophy of mathematics was in 1992, so I had no idea of Lavrou at the time. So the two reasons that we will propose in this talk about why this is, is that somebody in central casting, which says, oh, who takes what roles, has misplaced power in Europe rather than in the East and in mathematics rather than in the humanities. Um, 
The basic characteristics of this feature of uh, East and West were spelled out by William Haas. William was in fact Wilhelm because he was born in Germany and left it when uh, Germany went crazy and uh, went to Iran. Unusual from today's perspective that you find a refuge in, uh, in that place from another craziness. So, and so he learned firsthand how the East, the Eastern mentality is. And then uh, went to the United States and spent the rest of his life there. And this book appeared posthumously. He died the same year. The second explanation, so the first explanation, we're going to take it from Haas. The second is taken from Fromm, who says that there are two modes of existence, and we think that the being mode of existence is responsible for Brouwer's troubles. Um, and his reason for rejecting classical mathematics and formalism is that he sees them tainted with a heavy mode of existence. So these are closely related, though Fromm does not say that being mode of existence is East and the other is West. That's the big difference, yeah? Fromm allows for, for people in the Western tradition to subscribe to the being mode of existence. I mean, people like, you know, Meister Eckhart or Francesco of Assisi, you know, these are in the being mode of existence and they're in the Western tradition. So, or you know, Spinoza or so, so they're not, uh, you know, he's not that uh, East-West. But it's interesting to see both things and to see the reason I use Haas is that mathematics is the crown achievement of the Western approach in philosophy. So when somebody comes with the Eastern approach and tries to destroy this jewel, that's when you get into big trouble. So given the dominance of Greek philosophy in Western philosophy of mathematics, for as White had noted, the safest general characterization of the European philosophical tradition is that it consists of a series of footnotes to Plato and of the heavy mode of existence in society, a philosophy and a proposal for a reform in mathematics that go against these two pillars was doomed to failure. This is what I see the deep reasons that don't require any of Hilbert's axioms, uh, actions, which were a historical accident for its explanations. So we're, we're going to look at the intrinsic thing of the theory itself, rather than this is how Brouwer's personality was or Hilbert's personality of all this. So my point is that in any best approach, it would have suffered the same fate for reasons that are intrinsic. Now, what does Haas say about East and West? I'm going to take just a few quotations out of this book, The Destiny of the Mind. He says, however, the decisive act which constitutes Eastern mind and civilization, depositing or the fixing of the subject implies the idea of an existence entirely separated from and independent from the subject cannot be conceived. So this is very strong thing. This sounds like subjective idealism, right? So what becomes in the Western mind and civilization, the autonomous object is paralleled in the East by the other, which is coherent with and held in existence by the subject. In the history of Western philosophy, the importance of mathematical thought on the one hand and the idea of evolution on the other is vividly illustrated 
by the fact that with few exceptions, the most important philosophers can be grouped as those who were inspired by mathematical thinking and those who follow the line of the idea of evolution. In the mind of the East, the subject holds the predominant place occupied by the object in the West. Reduced to its essence, Eastern knowledge is a form of being, a state of consciousness that is lucid and self-sufficient. Western knowledge is a form of heaven. At the height of his fulfillment, the man of the East stands utterly alone. So this was all that I had to say from Haas. Now, what do we find in To Have or To Be by Erich Fromm? Optimum knowledge in the being mode is to know more deeply. In the having mode is to have more knowledge. Having refers to things, and things are fixed and describable. Being defer, refers to experience, and human experience is, in principle, not described. In contrast, the living human being is not a dead image and cannot be described like a thing. In fact, the living, living human being cannot be described at all. Indeed, much can be said about me, about my character, about my total orientation to life. This insightful knowledge can go very far in understanding and describing my own and another's physical structure. But the total me, my whole individuality, my suchness that is as unique as my fingerprints are, can never be fully understood, not even by empathy, for no two human beings are entirely alike. Only in the process of mutual alive relatedness can the other and I overcome the barrier of separateness in as, in as much as we both participate in the dance of life. Yet our full identification of each other can never be achieved. Language is an important factor in fortifying the having orientation. The name of a person, and we all have names, creates the illusion that he or she is a final immortal being. The person and the name become equivalent. The name demonstrates that the person is a lasting, indestructible substance and not a process. Common nouns have the same function, i.e. love, pride, hate, joy, give the appearance of fixed substances. But such nouns have no reality and only obscure the insight that we're dealing with processes going on in a human being. But even nouns that are names of things, such as table or lamp, are misleading. The words indicate that we are speaking of fixed substances, although things are nothing but a process of energy that causes certain sensations in our bodily system. If myself is constituted by what I have, then I am immortal if the things I have are indestructible. So that's it with the um sources of my explanation let's see what brower has to say this is in his uh, synopsis of intuition is in uh, the south african journal of science of 1952 or so the first act of intuition is completely separates mathematics from mathematical language in particular from the phenomena of language which are described by theoretical logic, and recognizes that intuitionist mathematics is an essentially languageless activity of the mind, having its origin in the perception of a move of time, i.e. of the falling apart of a life moment into two distinct things, one of which gives way to the other but is retained by memory. If the tuity thus born is divested of all quality, there remains the empty form of the common substratum of all tuities. It is this common substratum, this empty form, which is the basic intuition of mathematics. So we see that already trouble appears from the essential languageless activity. Once mathematics is that, you're already in big trouble. Um, but is he really alone and crazy in this, even in the world of mathematics? Obviously, in the world of non-mathematics, it's okay to say that things are languages. I mean, you know, my mystics always say that you can't, uh, you know, communicate your experience. So it's no big deal. I mean, if you were in, you know, in the humanities, it wouldn't be a problem. 
Um, but other other mathematicians, like you know, serious ones about which you don't say things that you say about Brower, you know. No? Rene Tom, which was a fields mathematist, let's see what he has to say. The world of ideas infinitely exceeds our technical possibilities. Notre modalité d'expression is the original. It is in the intuition that the ultima ratio of our faith in the truth of the theorem resides. And according to a now forgotten etymology, a theorem is above all the object of a vision. Theory to see. So, a summary of Brouwer's views on language. Language originates in will transmission in commands given to others, and thus of questionable morality. And its original aim is to break the will of others, making others obey. It is not on its own a means of communication, but in rare instances, it could become an aid in a communication that has been established by nonverbal means. Language is very inadequate at expressing the inner life of a human being. Language does not have the miraculous power of conjuring a lifelike world. It does not have a descriptive function in which it has shaken off the original sin of its birth as will transmission. So this is heavy stuff, right? If you, if you think about this uh, deeply and you realize that mathematics is usually think to think, thought of as being a written text, then it's, uh, we're in big trouble. Um, even in the very restricted field of mathematics, language cannot express faithfully the creations of a human subject, as these are living processes. Huh? And here is, so what you've seen earlier was my encapsulation of things he says here and there, because I don't have time to put up all these quotations. Huh? So in 1905 already, in this pamphlet, uh, Life, Art, and Mysticism, he writes, the immediate companion of the intellect is language. From life in the intellect follows the impossibility of any form of direct communication with others, instinctively by gesture of, or looks, or even more spiritually through all separation of distance. People therefore started training themselves and their offspring in some crude sign language, painfully and with little success, for never has anyone been able to communicate with others, soul to soul. Language can only be the accompaniment of an already existing mutual understanding. So, he focuses on the ineffability of things. You know, there are essential things. And, Usually people don't disagree about these things. Yeah, there are things that are, you know, but mathematics is supposed to be a mundane thing. I mean, it's not such a, you know, deep internal thing that you can't communicate. You think it's something kind of, you know, at the other extreme, you know, this is about, you know, poetry and mysticism, but mathematics isn't there. Um, again, in 1905, it says, but ridiculous is the use of language when one tries to express subtle nuances of will which are not part of the re living reality of those concerned. When, for example, so-called philosophers or metaphysicians discuss among themselves morality, God, consciousness, immortality, or the free will, these people do not even love each other, let alone share the subtle movements of the soul. Sometimes they even do not know each other personally. They either talk at cross purposes or each builds his own logical system, which lacks any connection with reality. And here is the important part for us. Log for logic is life in the human brain. It may accompany life outside the brain, but it can never guide it by virtue of its own power. So here is his disavowal of logic itself. So not only language, but logic is part of this linguistic structure and does not um, guide what happens in this languageless activity of the mind. 
Words are no more than commando signals, means of training and controlling. All verbal utterances are more or less developed verbal imperatives. Speaking can always be reduced to commands or threats and understanding to obey. Where does he write these things? In the crossed version of his doctoral dissertation. Who crossed this? Well, Kortevig, his, his advisor, because he thought these are irrelevant to the subject. Language by itself has no meaning. Any philosophy which searched for a firm foundation based on that presumption has come to grief. Lulled into sleep by the assurance of such firm foundation, one was rudely awakened by the appearance later of deficiencies and contradictions. A language which does not derive its certainty from the human will, but which claims to live on in the pure concept is an absurdity. What about logic? The practical reliability of the logical principles relies on the fact that a significant part of the world of intuition shows much more fidelity and satisfaction with respect to its finite organization than humanity itself. The fact that one has been from time immemorial blind to this sober interpretation has been caused by the fact that the exclusive character of words as means of will transmission has not been recognized. And these were seen as a result of a rash superstition, as suggestive means of fetish-like concepts. These concepts, as well as the links existing between them, are supposed to have an existence independently of the causal stance of man. And the logical principles should represent the concept, concepts and the a priori laws governing their connections. What about the chance of communication in his last major work uh, in this Congress of Philosophy in 48? In default of a plurality of mind, there is no exchange of thought either. Thoughts are inseparably bound up with the subject. So-called communicating of thoughts to somebody means influencing his actions. Agreeing with somebody means being contended with his cooperative acts or having entered into an alliance. By so-called exchange of thought with another being, the subject only touches the outer wall of an automaton. This can hardly be called mutual understanding. Only through the sensation of the other soul, sometimes a deeper approach is experienced. And when wisdom revealed by the beauty of this sensation finds expression in the antiphony of words exchange, then there may be mutual understanding. Now, let's see radically different views on language. So he, here we've seen what Brouwer has to say about this. Now, let, let's see where the trouble originates from. And here I'm going to choose two philosophers that are very much in the Western tradition, Nikolai Hartmann and Karl Popper. What do they think about uh, you know, language? Well, Hartmann assigns to the spiritual, das Geistige, its own stratum in the composition of the world one which cannot be reduced to subjective consciousness. Subjective is only the carrying out of the act of thinking. The content of the thought itself is the spiritual content that is detachable from the subject and transferable, a fact without which communication between humans would not be possible. What does Popper have to say? Well, Popper distinguishes between his famous three worlds. Um, well, first is the world of physical objects or physical states. Secondly, the world of states of consciousness or of mental states. Um, or perhaps the behavioral dispositions to act. And thirdly, the world of objective contents of thought, especially of scientific and poetic thoughts and works of art. Popper finds that this third world has more in common still with Bolzano's theory of a universe of proposition in themselves and truth in themselves, and resembles more closely the universe of Frege's objective contents of thought. He argues for the independent existence of the third world. Theories or propositions or statements are the most important third world linguistic entities. The activity of understanding consists essentially in operating with third world objects. Now, 
What does the East think about this great theory? Well, the Buddha says clearly that there is no such separation. Feeling, perception, and consciousness, friend, these states are conjoined and not disjoined. And it is impossible to separate each of these states from the other to describe the difference between them. For what one feels that one perceives, and what one perceives that one cognizes. Wisdom and consciousness, friend, these are states conjoined, not disjoined. And it is impossible to separate each of these states from the other to describe the difference between them. For what one wisely understand that one cognizes. Uh, and what one cognizes that one wisely understands. As pointed out by David Kalpahana, language as understood by the Buddha does not work on its own in the absence of what Brouwer calls an already existing mutual understanding. Language cannot be a means of communication unless the language users agree upon the various elements of a language as being expressive of their experiences. Thus agreement or concurrence, whether it be by a small group or of the world at large, is an important characteristic of, a lang of language. The use of the term samuti, which implies agreement in the sense of thinking together, makes language not merely a behavioral phenomenon, but a psychological one as well. The propositions in themselves, the truth in themselves, the objective content of thought, and in general, third world objects, claim a svabhava existence. Svabhava is something that is a term in Buddhism just meant to tell you that such a thing cannot exist. Svabhava means it exists of, out of itself. The whole thing of the Buddha, if you can encapsulate it to one thing, is dependent arising. The fact that nothing exists on its own and of its own. Everything depends on something else. So the objective contents of thought, the proposition, all this stuff is in direct contradiction with dependent arising. It claims that there are things that live on its own, that there is this world that lives in itself. And whether it is, you know, the Buddha himself or uh, later Mahayana Buddhists, that every, everyone agrees that there is no such thing in Buddhism. So um, self nature or own being cannot exist. So Svabhava is by definition the subject of contradictory ascriptions. If it exists, it must belong to an existing entity which means that it must be conditioned, dependent on other entities, and possessed of causes. But the svabhava is by definition unconditioned, not depending of other entities, and not caused. Thus the existence of a svabhava is impossible. So the, the, this idea that I can detach my thoughts and put them somewhere, or that they were somewhere even before they descended into my mind, this is total nonsense for the Buddha. Um, what is the view from general semantics of Al Alfred Korzybski? He is the, uh, there are several followers of his that use E prime. Have you heard about E prime? It's English without the verb to be. And there are people who can write this way or who can even speak this way. Why? Because is should never be used because it's confusing. There is no is. Is is you try to equate two things and it's very bad. You shouldn't do it. That's the, the stuff here. So words are not the things they represent. It follows that the objective levels, which include the events, ordinary object, objective actions, processes, immediate feelings, instincts, ideas, represent unspeakable levels, are not words. No? So is in particular should never be used because there is no equality of things. This is that is always wrong. What does Krishnamurti say? Understanding is not verbal, nor is that such a thing as intellectual understanding. 
intellectual understanding is only on the verbal level. And so no understanding at all. Understanding does not come as a result of thought, for thought, after all, is verbal. By the way, uh, in his late age, uh, Brower visited some of the uh, talks of Krishnamurti and said, well, this is the baby room of philosophy. Can we say the word is not the thing? Whatever the description, it is not the real, not the truth, however much you embellish or diminish it. Naming only strengthens and gives continuity to the experiencer, to the desire for permanency, to the characteristic of particularizing memory. There must be silent awareness of naming, and so the understanding of it. We name not only to communicate, but also to give continuity and substance to an experience, to revive it and to repeat its sensations. This naming process must cease, not only on the superficial levels of the mind, but throughout its entire structure. This is an arduous task, not to be easily understood or lightly experienced. For our whole consciousness is a process of naming, or terming experience and then storing or recording it. It is in this process, it is this process that gives nourishment and strength to the illusory identity, the experiencer is distinct and separate from the experience. Without thoughts, there is no thinker. Thoughts create the thinker who isolates himself to give himself permanency. For thoughts are always impermanent. We can find a, a confirmation of uh, this Brauerian view from Albert Schweitzer, which is no big deal because you won't find any book on ethics written in the analytical tradition in which his name is even mentioned. None of us can claim that we really know another person, even if we have lived together with that person every day for years. Of what makes up our inner experience, we cannot communicate even to our closest others more than fragments. We can neither give the entirety of that experience, nor could the others grasp it. We walk in a half darkness in which neither can recognize the other's features accurately. Only from time to time, through an experience we had with our companion, or through a word that falls between us, does the other stand next to us for a moment as if illuminated by a lightning bolt. That's when we see him as he is. Afterwards, we'll go again, perhaps for a long time, side by side in the dark and try in vain to imagine the other's features. Now, what do Maturana and Varela say in, in their book, Autopoiesis? Does this uh, seem to be a great uh, defense of Brower? Not necessarily, because Varela was uh, a student of Chögyam Trumpa, a Tibetan Buddhist who established a crazy uh, organization in the state of Colorado. And he was, uh, Varela was also the founder of a, of a group of the dialogue of the sciences and Buddhists. So he was also a friend of the Dalai Lama. So he's tinted with the Eastern approach. But let's see what they have to say. Humberto Maturana and Varela. So long as language is considered to be denotative, it will be. I, I don't mind it at all. Yeah. Uh, so long as language is considered to be denotative, it will be necessary to look at it as a means for the transmission of information, as if something were transmitted from organism to organism, in a manner such that the domain of uncertainties of the receiver should be reduced according to the specifications of the sender. However, when it is recognized that language is connotative and not denotative, and that its function is to orient the orientee within his cognitive domain without regard 
for the cognitive domain of the orienter, it becomes apparent that there is no transmission of information through language. Ooh. So serious people, so-called, uh, agree with Brouwer. You know? um, it behooves the orientee as a result of an in independent internal operation upon his own state to choose where to orient his cognitive domain. The choice is called by the message, but the orientation thus produced is independent of what the message represents for the orient. In a strict sense, then, there is no transfer of thought from the speaker to his interlocutor. The listener creates information by reducing his uncertainty through his interactions in his cognitive domain. Consensus arises only through cooperative interactions in which the resulting behavior of each organism becomes subservient to the maintenance of both. Henri Poincaré in 1913 says something similar. People do not understand each other because they do not speak the same language and because there are languages that cannot be learned. So you see, this crazy guy is not so crazy after all. If you put him in the right uh, you know, room, he speaks the language of these people. That's what I want to show, that there is no craziness. It's just crazy if you come in mathematics with this. You know, I mean, yeah, Poincaré was also in mathematics. But in general, there, there are so many people that think the same way. You just went to the wrong um, you know, faculty, you know. Now, what's the root of the misunderstanding of this solipsism accusation? The philosophers, what they're doing is they take all Brouwer's uh, utterances literally and absolutely. So they deliberately refuse to take notice of the fact that the same person who wrote dismissively about the capabilities of language to provide exact communication by means of objective contents of thought, also wrote about its inherent and wrote about its inherent limitations, was involved in the significance project and was a master of a highly evocative language as related in a recollection of Gerit Manuri's daughter. She described Brouwer's conversation as an almost artistic process. Brouwer could, in the middle of a sentence, pause to savor a particular expression and to replace it after consideration by a more suitable one. She remembered him standing in the garden, stretching out his hand, tasting a particular wood and contemplating fitting equivalents. The result was not a faltering flow of words, Brouwer had mastered the technique of refinement to such a degree that he managed to produce gentle, flowing sentences of incredible length without discernible interruptions. So the Significs project was meant to transform language into something that, re that reflects better values of solidarity and so on. He invited the greatest people of the, of the time, Martin Buber, Raminrat Tagore, and so on, to join this, pro this project. So it wasn't like you know, he was this crazy guy who says the language is no good, not at all. But this is how he's taken to me. So what Brouwer does actually, he realizes that is a bad means for mutual understanding, but we have no choice but to try the impossible. So as Verena Hubert Dyson would put it, formalization and poetry are the two most direct means we have of externalizing our thoughts. The unusual thing is that Brouwer chose poetry rather than formalization. Why? Because it has no pretension of conveying anything exactly and opts for hinting a state of mind, a feeling, or an atmosphere. And this he found as, his, as a student at the University of Amsterdam, listening to Gerrit Manuri, more helpful than the precision of strings of symbols. Um, 
he finds that the nature of language turns us into Sisyphean absurd heroes, much like characters of Kafka's world as seen by Albert Camus. Kafka's world is in truth an indescribable universe in which man allows himself the tormenting luxury of fishing in a bathtub, knowing that nothing will come of it. So yes, we are thrown upon language for communication, but we should be aware that there is no communication. And this is what Brower says. Now, this kind of a thing which is usually thrown onto Brower is that, you know, this is subjective idealism. My point is that it's all Eastern. Well, is subjective idealism Eastern or not? Well, it is. In 1946, in uh, a book published in Paris, uh, Les Origines de l'Idéalisme Subjectif, uh, L'Inscription du Roi Shabaka, Aram Frenkian notices that there is not a hint of subjective idealism in any Greek philosophical work that precedes the context of the East brought about by Alexander. He detected the first text suggestive of subjective idealism in the Memphite theology. So this inscription that is in the British Museum, which dates from the 25th dynasty of Egypt, where we are told that great and important is Ta, who gave life to all the gods and their cause as well, through his heart and his tongue. Similar utter utterances can be found in earlier Egyptian texts, such as the Coffin text, the late 18th and early 19th dynasties. We have independent confirmation of this, of this being what? The Egyptian origin of subjective idealism from Allen who's uh, James Allen is a, uh, an uh, e Egyptologist who wrote a, a book on this. Um, and who says exactly this, that the origin of subjective idealism is there without even quoting Frenkiano with a probably being unaware of this. Um, we have another case of subjective idealism in uh, certain mind school only, uh, mind only schools of Mahayana Buddhism, such as the Lankavatara Sutta, where um, this uh, the most extreme version we find it in uh, Nagarjuna, who says that the material world in the final analysis cannot exist. Now, what about the single intuition of time that we find? So, okay, we looked at language, but about the single intuition of time. Um, this is Brouwer's middle way between nominalism and Platonism. So, uh, just as, as Buddha invented this uh, dependent arising, to not fall into nihilism or essentialism. So the Brower, Brower has this intuition of time to not fall into the extremes of nominalism or Platonism. Or the extreme of naturalism, which declared to be to all of mathematics to be ultimately a product of the human nervous system which is a, depend, uh, a position uh, defended by Jean-Pierre Changeu and Platonism, which was backed in this famous conversation by Alain Kohn. So it's neither nor when there is this intuition of time that generates mathematics. It's not 
a product of the human nervous system. In fact, Brouwer was completely against any psychological interpretation of intuition. It's not has nothing to do with a certain you know, thing that happens uh, psychologically. So he thought that these things are universal. These things are not connected to just one person. Um, and Brouwer is very keen on denying mathematics this kind of outer self-existence. Yeah, so there is no svabhava in, in Brouwer. Mathematics comes and dies with a human being. And so it is dependently originated. It's originated in this intuition of time, and that's it. It exists in dependence, just like dependent arising. Now, how was this intrusion of dependent arising on the altar of Western philosophy taken? Well, let's see what two Western philosophers, Nikolai Hartmann and Felix Kaufmann, have to say about this. When you read these kinds of things, it's as if they read Haas's book, internalized what it says, and produce the expected answers. Here is Nikolai Hartmann. Intuition is from the starter mode of cognition, i.e. the grasping, a grasping, a transcendental, a, a transcendent act. In that, it differs essentially from the setting, and it is just the theory that misjudges that. The truth of intuition is that it is not a giving act, but a receiving receptive act, and that the giving authority behind it ought to be searched for at the object. It is the one who determines the intuition to the extent that it presents itself to it. And that happens as, a, as an object that is indifferent to the very act of intuition. It is thus already assumed as an existent in itself. In case such an object were not to present itself, in case no existent were available that would have its particular suchness already as its own, then the act itself would not be a seeing apprehension either. So exactly like Haas tells us, in the West, it's the object, in the East, it's the subject. So Hartmann cannot understand how the subject can create something if the object doesn't exist. So he has no understanding of dependent arising. Felix Kaufmann says the same thing. For Brouwer's view that mathematical facts change with mathematical knowledge, implies that there is something cognizable that is created only by being cognized, which runs counter to the nature of cognition. For all cognition presupposes an object that must be thought of as existing independently of its being cognized. Now, in physics, this is not as outlandish. I mean, physicists were forced to accept the observer in the story. It's not because they are so much more enamored by the Eastern thought, but because they had to. Experiments forced them. Here is what David Bohm has to say. Now, David Bohm obviously is on the wrong side because we know that he's super controversial. Um, but not super controversial by being, uh, you know, extreme right or something. He was a communist up to the Hungarian Revolution of 1956. So the idea, the generally ideological idea to think that the guys with intuition and with uh, the human nature and so on are kind of right wingers and the uh, guys with everything goes are, uh, you know, the left wingers is kind of simple minded and doesn't fit at all the reality. Of things. So here is what Bohm has to say. The weakness of thought is that thought inevitably separates itself from what it thinks about. It creates an imaginary other, which it calls the object, which is still really thought. Let's say I'm thinking about the image of a tree. Now that which I'm thinking about seems to be separated from me. It seems the image is over there somewhere, and I'm here. 
Therefore, it seems that I have created two images. One is the tree and the other is me. Sounds very much like what, what Brouwer is saying. Jean Largeau again. He says intuitionism had something aristocratic about it, which is connected with the exceptional nature of intuition. Despite this fact, intuition, pure and disinterested knowledge that it is, is universal rather than individual, which refutes the legend of solipsism, which has been attributed to the Dutch geometer, Brouwer's uh, meant here. So, exactly like Brouwer would say, this is nothing that has to do with psychology. This is universal. What does Goethe say about this? The question is, if you say that mathematics originates in intuition, then everybody would say, oh, but I have your intuition, you have yours, then we have created anarchy inside mathematics because nobody knows anymore what we're talking about because it's everything is specific to myself well as as Larjou says that's not true it's not specific to yours the thing that happens in yourself is universal it's not specific and this is what Goethe says in one of his Maxims in Maxima und Reflexionen, which appeared post posthumously in 1833. In case I know my relation to myself and to the outside world, I call it truth. And in that way, everyone can have their own truth. And it, nev it is nevertheless always the same. Again, the wrong kind of person who comes to the defense of Brouwer, right? You wouldn't throw Goethe in a discussion of the philosophy of mathematics. No? But all I'm saying is, this is not crazy. Pe people who are respectable people are saying this. Um, what happens now, okay, we have this first act of intuitionism, and then there is the second act by which you create the intuitionistic continuum. So how does it work? Well, you create this choice sequences, which you know, up to a place they are determined, and from there on, you don't know what happens to them. They're open to the future. So they are not objects uh, in the sense of, in this sense of, I can put my hand on it. They they incorporate becoming in themselves. So Brouwer also found the need to introduce a new language for this. He avoids, for example, the word set. So there are marked uh, similarities with the Buddha. The Buddha needed a language that avoided substantialist and nihilist implications. This was the language of becoming that more accurately reflected his experience of change and continuity. It is the language of dependent arising that steered clear of the extremes of permanent existence and nihilistic non-existence. Thus the Buddha can be credited with revolution in linguistic philosophy when he consistently utilized the language of becoming to take the venom off the language of existence. Jean Largeau again. Does this mean that our mathematics is based on a substance attribute ontology reflected in our language to fact the same thing that I said earlier? Uh, inherited from the ancient Greeks where here we have an ontology of processes. Let's see a discussion of Einstein and Rabindranath Tagore and that took place in, um, in a villa outside Berlin. In, um, the uh, late 20s. There are two different, Einstein says, there are two different conceptions about the nature of the universe. The world as a unity dependent on humanity, the world as a reality independent of the human factor. Tagore says, well, when our universe is in harmony with man, the eternal, we know it as truth, we feel it as beauty. This is a purely human conception of the universe. Truth then or beauty is not dependent of man? No. 
If there would be no human beings anymore, the Apollo of Belvedere would not be beautiful, would no longer be beautiful? No. I agree with the regard to this conception of beauty, but not with regard to truth. Why not? Truth is realized through men. I cannot prove that my conception is right, but that is my religion. So here we see that a 20th century Indian uh, poet thinks in the same way, that it's not just, uh, you know, you may think, well, why do you come with Buddha who lived 2,500 years ago when there was no science or mathematics to speak of to talk about these things? Well, well, you can hear somebody who knows about science and mathematics and he still says these things. Now, you would ask yourself, well, why did I defend this guy, you know? After all, I'm a formalist, right? And my thing comes from, you know, Pieri, uh, Hilbert, and so on. So shouldn't I uh, defend my tribe and, you know, uh, be against this evil person, you know? Um, but I think that that would be kind of pathetic because uh, as Albert Schweitzer said, where in truth, when we experience conflicts increasingly deeper, the good conscience is an invention of the dead. And uh, so it might seem strange that Brouwer searches the ultimate answers, whether for the source of mathematical intuition or wisdom in himself, in introspection, but he is in good company not only Albert Schweitzer, but also Salman Baruch Rabinkov, a, uh, a teacher of uh, Fromm, who Fromm says that he influenced uh, his life more than any other man. What does Schweitzer say? He says the great secret is to go through life as an unconsumed person. Such an outcome is possible to the one who, instead of reckoning with people and facts, is thrown back on oneself and seeks the ultimate reason for things in oneself. And Rabinkov says Judaism ascribes absolute value in its teachings only to this autonomous human being who connects nature and spirit in a continuous synthesis. To the extent that the condition of autonomy is satisfied, Jewish doctrine does not recognize any difference in rank between humans. Everyone is entitled and obliged to say, the world was created for my own sake. Because every human being is an end in itself and is, as it were, burdened with the responsibility for the whole of creation. And we have even a, uh, some help from somebody who comes from a culture which uh, stereotypically is thought as believing in uh, communication by means of words. It's uh, Salvatore Quasimodo. He says that ognuno sta solo sul cuore della terra, trafitto da un raggio di sole, ed è subito sera. That's it.